Well, hey, welcome to the First Church. So great to see you guys. And right now we have family meeting on our Stone Canyon campus, as well as others who will be joining us later online. So if you would, let's say hello by welcoming them into our time of study here today. I don't know about you guys, but I'm not a huge fan of scary movies. Now, my wife Allison is. She loves scary movies, but I don't. And this time of year, you see a lot of them advertised. They come on TV, out in theaters. And the reason why I don't like scary movies isn't because the plot line scares me or the Emmy nightmares or anything like that. I don't like scary movies because of a little technique they use to scare you called a jump scare. You guys know what I'm talking about? It's when the villain or the bad guy pops up unexpectedly and they want you to jump, they want you to scream, they want to catch you off guard. I hate those moments. And I remember when Alice and I were first started dating, uh, she asked me to go see a scary movie with her, and I agreed, didn't want to, but I went with her. And we were watching this movie, and it was fine. I mean, I wasn't scared at all. Yeah, I was actually laughing through different parts of the movie because I thought, this is so predictable, and I know exactly what's going to happen. And then all of a sudden, there's one of those jump scare moments. And as soon as this happened, the entire theater jumped. I mean, it caught everybody off guard. I jumped too, and I, I'm going to throw out my main card right now, I scream like a little girl, I promise you. And I wasn't sure if like Allison heard me, if anybody else heard me, because there were a lot of people screaming in that moment. And so I turned to her to look at her and she was smiling and she said, did you hear that teenage girl scream beside you? And I thought, she doesn't know it's me. You know, I'm off the hook, this is great. So then I turned and there wasn't a teenage girl sitting beside me. And I said, Allison, there's not a teenage girl sitting beside me. And she said, oh, did I say beside you? I meant the teenage girl sitting beside me. She caught me, I mean, she was calling me out. I just don't like to be scared like that. I don't like to be caught off guard. I don't like for somebody to try to jump me. And that reminds me of a website I came across not too long ago of this haunted house up in Canada. It's not a real haunted house. We don't believe in that stuff. I get that, but still, this haunted house is all for fun up in Canada where they take a picture of you at the scariest point of your tour through this haunted house and they post these pictures online for you to see. And I wanna share some of them with you because I think they're hilarious. Look at this first picture. Now, I love these guys, you know, because you know they walked into this haunted house as tough guys. You know, we're not going to be scared. And then in a moment of panic, in a moment of horror, look at them. They're terrified. I love it. How about this next picture? Now, those guys, again, it's more macho men, right? We're going to be tough. And I'm sure they're very excited that that picture is all over the internet now for everyone to see. I love this next picture as well. Now, this girl is probably thinking, my, God is, my guy is going to protect me and keep me safe. Not happening. He's terrified. He kind of turns into a cartoon in this moment, you know? How about this next picture? Now, this one's great because this guy, he is not a lover or a fighter. He is a runner. He is out of there. You know, he's gone. But my favorite one is this last picture. Look at the eyes of the mom and daughter. I mean, isn't that great? I mean, they're they're terrified. I don't know what's going on with that dad. I think he's having an out-of-body experience or something. I'm not sure either that he's on something. But I love those pictures. And the reason why those people reacted the way they did is because they were caught off guard. Something jumped them. Something scared them. And for the past few weeks, we've been talking about how we have an enemy, Satan, who wants to jump us who wants to catch us off guard, but here's the difference. He doesn't want to catch us off guard just to scare us. He wants to destroy us. He wants to devour us. He wants to devastate our lives. We've been looking at a passage from 1 Peter. In 1 Peter 5, 8, it says, Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, looking for someone to devour. The Bible doesn't hide the fact that we have an enemy, who's out to get us, who's scheming and plotting against us, who wants to devour us, wants to destroy our lives. And if that's all the Bible said about him, then we would have reason today to be scared. But we've pointed out the past few weeks how that verse is sandwiched between some other statements that should give us hope. When you back on up in verse 8, look at what Peter writes. Be alert and sober and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Resist him. Standing firm in the faith. In other words, when we're alert, when we have a sober mind, when we're focused, when we're clear-headed, when we're paying attention, we can be aware of Satan's schemes. We can see him coming so that we can resist him standing firm in our faith. Satan doesn't have to catch us off guard. But when we're not paying attention and we're not focused and we don't have a clear mind, he can get us. And what Satan likes to do is use obstacles that we don't see coming to try to, to try to throw us off the path that God wants us to take. He likes to use things like 
negativity and cynicism, irrelevance, burnout, envy, anger, self-righteousness. These are things that we should see coming, but we don't. And what I'm referring to these things as in this series are blind spots. And this is how I'm defining a blind spot, a spiritual blind spot. It's a hidden, ignored, or overlooked obstacle that threatens to derail our relationship with Jesus or disrupt the calling he's placed on our lives. These are things that we should see coming, but for whatever reason we don't because we're not looking for them, we're not ready for them. And so what we're doing in this series is we're looking at these hidden, ignored, and overlooked obstacles to make sure that they don't wreck our lives, to make sure they don't stink up on us, to make sure that Satan is not able to use them to get us, and we're trying to expose them. And so this morning, we're going to look at another one of these blind spots, and we're going to look at compromise. Now, sometimes when you hear the word compromise, you probably think of a good thing, because compromise can be good in some circumstances, but we're talking about spiritual compromise, and spiritual compromise is never a good thing. I'm defining it like this. Spiritual compromise is making choices or decisions that create a growing disconnect between who you are and who God wants you to be. Choices or decisions that create a growing disconnect between who you are and who God wants you to be. Spiritual compromise is when you make choices and you do things that God doesn't want you to do, that are not in line with his plan for your life. And all compromise starts out small. A little lie here, a little cutting of a corner there, and pretty soon it leads to another and then another and another until you're somewhere where you never thought you would be. Your life is a mess. The subtle and small compromises we make in the day-to-day, the rational lies, the half-truths, the excuses, will eventually leave our entire lives compromised. And we end up selling out our character, our integrity, our faith, all for the dark forces of things like pride, lust, greed, blind ambition, jealousy, wealth, popularity, fame, and the list just goes on and on. And it's not that we ever wanted to sell out our soul to the devil, We just allowed him to rent it on occasion. And then we allowed him to rent it more and more and more until it's kind of a rent-to-own thing. And we're people that we never intended to be. That's why Paul warns in Ephesians 4, 27, do not give the devil a foothold. In other words, don't give Satan an opportunity to seduce you. Don't give Satan an opportunity to entice you, to hook you. Because here's the thing, nothing we do, we do in isolation. Everything we do has consequences. And the actions that we carry out, the words that we say can affect our own personal character, they can affect our relationship with others, and they can affect our relationship with God. And we see this pretty plainly in an example that's recorded for us in the Old Testament. We see this in the life of a man named Lot. So if you have your Bibles or a Bible app on your phone or tablet, go ahead and turn with me to the book of Genesis. That's where we're going to be camped out today. And we're going to look at many different scriptures in the book of Genesis as we go through the life of this man named Lot. If you have the First Church app, you can follow along there. The scriptures are on that app. And if you don't have any of those things, you can follow along with the screen behind me because we're going to have all the scriptures printed for you. But we're going to look at this man named Lot and start in Genesis chapter 13. Now those of you who know your Old Testament history, you know that Lot is Abraham's nephew. And Lot and Abraham, they were kind of business partners. They worked together. They raised livestock, and they were extremely wealthy. They had a ton of land, a ton of animals, and a ton of people working for them. They had a lot of money, very successful. But you guys know, if you've ever worked with family, that's not always the ideal situation. It doesn't always work out like you want it to. And so there's some tension that develops between Lot and Abraham, his workers, and both of their workers. And so one day, Abraham comes to Lot and says, listen, we don't need to let our business practices come between our family so this is what we need to do we need to divide the land we've got plenty of it you can work half the land I'll work the other half and that way we don't let our business practices get in the way and so Lot says I think this is a great idea and Abraham is the bigger person and Abraham says listen Lot I'll let you pick whatever portion of the land you want you get to pick the land you want and I'll take whatever is left and so Lot decides to pick part of the land for him to raise his livestock on And listen to the choice that Lot makes. It's found in Genesis chapter 13, verse 11. And the scripture says, So Lot chose for himself the whole plain of the Jordan and set out toward the east. The two men parted company. Abram lived in the land of Canaan, while Lot lived among the cities of the plain and pitched his tents near Sodom. Now the men of Sodom were wicked and were sinning greatly, against the Lord. 
So Lot has hundreds of square acres, miles uh, to choose from of land. And he decides to pick the land that's closest to this city called Sodom. Now Sodom still has a reputation in our day. And it definitely had a reputation in Abraham and Lot's day. It was a wicked and wild city. A city where its citizens did a lot of things that greatly offended Abraham and Lot's God. So why would Lot, who by the way the Bible refers to as a righteous man, why would Lot pick the land that's closest to Sodom if he has a choice? But not only that, the scripture tells us that he put his tent, he built his home as close to the city limits of Sodom as he possibly could. Why would Lot do that? Well, I think it's kind of like when you tell a little kid not to touch something. If I had my son Alex, who's five years old, up on the stage with me today, and I said, Alex, don't touch this basket, you know what he would do? He would wait for me to look away. And then the moment that I looked away, he would get as close to that basket as he could. And then if I turned, he would say, Daddy, I'm not touching it. And then he might even want to play a little game with me and like wave his hand. Look, Daddy, I'm not touching it. I'm not touching it. And he knows that makes me mad, but still he does it. I'm not touching it. And I think that's what Lot's doing here. I'm getting as close to Sodom as I can, but I'm not actually going to live there. I'm not touching it. I'm not participating in what they're doing, but I'm getting as close to Sodom as I possibly can. Reminds me of a test that was done years ago, a research study that was done years ago at Stanford University. It's been repeated multiple times since then. It's called the marshmallow test. You may have heard of this. What researchers did when they conducted this study, they brought a little kid into a room and they placed a marshmallow on a plate in front of them. And they said, if you can sit in this room for 15 minutes and not eat this marshmallow, then we'll come back in and we'll give you a second marshmallow. But if you eat it, then that's all you get. It's a great test in self-control. And this is what it looks like when it's caught on camera. Take a look at these clips. Okay, sit in that chair. All right, here's the deal. Marshmallow for you. You can either wait, and I'll give you another one if you wait, or you can eat it now. When I come back, I'll give you two, another one. So then you'll have two. But stay in here and stay in the chair till I come back, okay? okay. All right. I'm gonna go do something and then I'll come back. It smells yummy. It smells really good. How'd you do? Did you do good? You did? Yeah. You wanted to eat it, didn't you? Yeah. So did I tell you I'd give you another one? Okay, now you can have both. You need them. <laughs> Now we can laugh at those little kids and those videos, but here's the thing. Don't we as adults do the same thing? God says, this is sin. Don't eat it. We say, okay, God, we're not gonna eat it. We're gonna pick it up. We're gonna sniff it. We're gonna touch it. I'm gonna lick it. I'm not gonna do that. It's kind of gross if I did that in front of you, but still. We're going to play with it a little bit. But we're not eating it, God. We're not sinning. Let me ask you today, what's your marshmallow? What is it that's calling out to you? What is it that you're a little bit too close to? What's your marshmallow? Because we all have one. There's probably something right now in your life that God doesn't want you near, and you're a little bit too close to it. What is it for you? See, for Lot, it was the city of Sodom. And he was a little bit too close to Sodom for comfort. I had a college professor, a Bible college professor, who said, don't ever flirt with sin. Because when you flirt with sin, eventually it leads to sin. So I want to call this stage that Lot's in right now in our passage, I want to call this the flirtation stage. Now, that's not original to me. I've heard a bunch of people refer to this stage of compromise as the flirtation stage. But I think there's no better description for it than that. Because what's flirting? Flirting is getting as close to something as you can without actually committing to it. And I think that's what Lot's doing here. And don't we do the same? 
I mean, don't we flirt with sin on occasion? And we say, uh, yeah, I'm going to go to that party, but I'm not going to participate in what everybody else is doing. I just want to go there to hang out with my friends. I'm not going to do this stuff that they're doing. At least that's what we tell ourselves. Uh, yeah, I just reconnected with an old friend on Facebook. And yeah, we used to date, but we're both married now. We would never cheat on our spouse. I mean, that would never happen. We're good. That's what we tell ourselves. Yeah, I've been having these texting conversations late at night, and I'm probably getting close to crossing a line that God doesn't want me to cross, but it's just texting. I'm not doing anything wrong. That's what we tell ourselves. I have a friend who often says the first step away from God is always a small one. I mean, you may have never planned on embezzling money from your place of work, but you cut a corner here and you cut a corner there and the next thing you know, you're somewhere where you never thought you would be. You may have never thought about cheating on your wife, but that coworker of the opposite sex who likes to hang around your desk a little too often, well, she asked you to go to lunch one day and you went. Hey, it's innocent, I'm just having lunch with a coworker. And then pretty soon, you're where you never intended on being. The first step away from God is always a small one. And that's Lot. Lot is way too close to Sodom. And look at what happens next. In Genesis 14, if you want to jump over there in verse 12, we find out that Abram's nephew Lot was living in Sodom. Now, just one chapter before, he's living close to Sodom. Now he's in Sodom. And this is what I'm going to call the justification stage of compromise. This is the moment when you start to justify why you're doing what you know you shouldn't be doing. I mean, can't you hear a lot saying, well, all of my business comes from Sodom, and my family, we do all of our shopping in Sodom. It just makes sense for us to live there. I'm going to save on gas money, plus the taxes to live there. It's cheaper to live there. I mean, they have better sports programs and a better school system for my kids. And there's a lot more people there that are our age. Besides that, they've got to drive through Starbucks. We don't have that out on the plains. I mean, it just makes sense that we would move to Sodom. I mean, don't you understand? And so we end up selling ourselves a bunch of lies that sound logical, that sound reasonable for doing what we know we shouldn't be doing. I'm not really stealing from my place of work. I've put in a bunch of overtime they haven't paid me for. They owe me that money. Hey, I'm way underpaid anyway. I'm not stealing from my place of work. That's, that money is owed to me. We're just living together to save money. I mean, everybody's doing that. We need to save some money before we get married. So we're just living together to save money or maybe, hey, we're just living together to get to, get to know one another. I mean, everybody does that in this day and age. You want to make sure that you know one another before you commit to each other in marriage. And I hear couples say that. And my response is always the same. Out of love, I tell them all the research that's being done, and this is not Christian research. This is secular research. 80% of couples who live together before they get married end up divorced. 80%. There's a reason why God put up certain parameters and boundaries for us because he knows what will end well and what won't end well. But they will tell you, hey, we're going to be part of that 20%. Really? I'm not hurting anybody. It's just porn. I'm not actually cheating on my spouse. I'm not actually having premarital sex. It's just porn. I'm not hurting anybody but me. Well, you are hurting God, but you don't realize how much you're hurting you. Because pornography does psychological damage to us. Not only that, it will rob us of intimacy in our marriage or our future marriage. The studies are showing that as well. Or maybe you've heard somebody say, well, God wants me to be happy. And if God wants me to be happy, then it's okay if I abandon my kids or abandon my spouse and go pursue this or pursue that person over there. Hey, God just wants me to be happy. We tell ourselves these rational lies. It would be like the other day, my family, we were in our kitchen and Allison was putting dishes in our dishwasher. She had the door to the dishwasher open and we took our eyes off Addie, our one and a half year old, for just a second. And you know you can't do that. And when we took our eyes off her, she reached into our dishwasher and she pulled out a sharp knife. And thank goodness she, uh, she didn't touch the blade, but still she pulled it out and she's holding this knife. And what if I would have said, well, at least she's smiling, at least she's laughing and having a good time. Go ahead, play with it. 
A loving parent would never do that. You know what I did? I ran to her. I grabbed that knife from her. There's no way I'm going to let my one and a half go play with a sharp knife. A loving parent would never do that. And so when God gives us instructions and teachings, commands in Scripture, it's not that he's trying to rob us of our fun. He's not trying to hold us back or stifle our joy or anything like that. He loves us. And he knows what will end well and what won't end well. And honestly, that's what a loving, godly friend will do too. A loving, godly friend will come to you and will cut you off before you go down the path you shouldn't go down and say, listen, if you keep going down that path, it's not going to end well. But apparently Lot didn't have someone like that in his life because he just kept going down that path. The Bible tells us he lives in Sodom for 13 years And after living in Sodom for 13 years, Genesis 19 verse 1 says that Lot was sitting in the gateway of the city. Now that may seem like an insignificant detail to you, but it's a pretty huge detail. Because you have to understand the context of the ancient world. In the ancient world, those who sat in the city gates, those were the leaders of the city. They were the elders of the city. We might say the town council or the city council So by Genesis 19, 1 telling us that Lot was sitting in the gateway of the city, what the Bible is letting us know is after 13 years of living in Sodom, now Lot is a leader in the city of Sodom. He's an elder of the people. He's a town councilman, so to say. So I want you to wrap your mind around this. First, Lot is close to Sodom. Then he's in Sodom. Now he's of Sodom. We'll call this the transformation stage of compromise. Now typically when I preach and I use the word transformation, I use it in a positive sense because I talk about how Jesus can transform and change our lives and that's a good thing. But transformation can also go in the opposite direction. Transformation can also be a bad thing, especially when we're so far into sin, we don't even see it as sin anymore. The book of Jeremiah talks about a whole generation of God's people who were transformed in the wrong direction. And Jeremiah 6.15 says, they should be ashamed of the terrible way they act, but they are not ashamed at all. They don't even know how to blush about their sins. And that was Lot. He had conformed so much to the culture of Sodom that what once would have embarrassed him no longer embarrasses him. What once would have brought him shame no longer brings him shame. And we see this played out as we read on in chapter 19. Because in Genesis 19, the Bible lets us know that God sends two heavenly messengers to visit Lot. And these heavenly messengers, we believe they're angels who just take on the appearance of men. These angels come and they visit Lot, they stay in his house, and they talk to him. They give him a message from God. But here's the thing. These angelic creatures who took on the form of men, they have perfect bodies. And the people, the men of Sodom, noticed them. And these angelic beings, they go stay at Lot's house. And as Lot is speaking with them, visiting with them, there's a knock on his door. Actually, there's a whole mob trying to beat down his door. The men of Sodom have this mob-like mentality. And they're gathered around Lot's front door, screaming, trying to get into his house. And you know what they're saying? Send those visitors out. Send those two men out to us so we can have our way with them. We're all adults. We know what that means. That's the level of wickedness in Sodom. That's how evil these men are. And Lot goes out his front door, shuts the door behind him to protect his heavenly visitors. And listen to what Lot says to these men. Genesis 19, verse 7. No, my friends, don't do this wicked thing. Something's always bugged me about that. Do you notice how Lot addresses these evil, wicked men of Sodom? My friends, we become like the people we're around the most. And what happens next is absolutely unbelievable to me. It is gross, it is disgusting, it is deplorable. I can't imagine saying this. But Lot 
this righteous man in verse 8 as he's addressing the crowd. Look at what he tells them. See, the crowd won't give up. They keep asking for these men to come out. They're going to burn down the house. They're going to kill Lot. If they don't get these men, these visitors. And look at what Lot says. Look, I have two daughters who have never slept with a man. Let me bring them out to you and you can do what you like with them. But don't do anything to these men. What? If Lot's response makes you feel uncomfortable, it should. I'm a parent. I'm a dad. I would do anything to protect my kids. I have a daughter. I can't imagine saying something like that, even thinking something like that. I don't know a dad out there that would say something like that. But that's what compromise does. Compromise is a slippery slope that slowly takes us captive. It's a gradual digression, a slow fade. It starts off with one simple step in the wrong direction. And then pretty soon you are light years away from where you ever wanted to be. And that's Lot. And as we get to the end of his life, it doesn't get much better. See, Lot ends up having to escape the city of Sodom because God's going to destroy it because of its wickedness. So Lot and his family, they have to escape. But here's the thing. His wife is so enamored with the culture of Sodom, she doesn't want to leave. She ends up getting destroyed along with it in a tragic death. And I imagine that when Lot was a young man still working out on the plains with his uncle Abraham, I bet Lot never thought to himself, you know, I hope that one day my wife dies a tragic death because she's so trapped, she's so fixated on the culture of Sodom. And I hope, I hope that I get to the point where I have to go live in a cave because that's how Lot's life ends. He and his daughters, they escape and they go and they hide out in a cave for the rest of his days and it gets even worse. In Genesis chapter 19, as they're living in this cave, Lot and his daughters, follow along with me and see what happens. Luke 19, verse 30. He, Lot, and his two daughters lived in a cave. And one day the older daughter said to the younger, Our father is old, and there is no man around here to lie with us, sleep with us, as is the custom all over the earth. Let's get our father to drink wine, let's get him drunk, and then lie with him, and preserve our family line through our father. Jump down to verse 36. So both of Lot's daughters became pregnant by their father. I'm sure Lot never thought that his wife would be so enamored by the culture of Sodom that she would die with it. I'm sure Lot never thought that he would spend the rest of his days hiding out in a cave. And I'm sure Lot never thought that his daughters would be so immoral themselves that they would get him drunk and he would end up impregnating them. Lot probably never thought that that's how his life would end up. But that's the slippery slope of compromise. Eventually, it will take us captive and it will devastate our lives. So I'm going to call this last stage of compromise the devastation stage. Because over time, that's what compromise does. It leaves you devastated. It leaves your life a mess. Several years ago, I was reading about a 37-year-old woman in Allentown, Pennsylvania. Her name's Kelly who died a tragic death because her family, they had a pet black bear, who they nicknamed Teddy, by the way. And they had this pet black bear. They raised the bear from the time he was a cub. And then eventually one day he grew up, 350-pound bear. She's cleaning his cage, and the bear turns on her and kills her. And I remember reading about this online, and they were interviewing one of the family members, and the family member was just in shock. And they said, we didn't see this coming. We didn't expect this at all. We really don't know how this happened. We raised Teddy from the time he was a cub. He was part of our family. We played with him every single day. We fed him. He was one of us. And now we're devastated. Now, I don't want to lessen that family's loss at all because it is tragic. 
As I'm reading the words of this family member who was interviewed by the news, I thought, really? You didn't see this coming? I mean, you can nickname a bear Teddy, but he's still a black bear. He's still a wild animal. He's still a ferocious beast that you put in your home. You really didn't see this coming? But isn't that what we do with sin? We feed sin, we play with it, we nurture it, we welcome it in our homes, only for it to totally and utterly devastate our lives. That's what happened to Lot. Now the Bible could give us this story, this example of Lot and say, hey, don't compromise, stay away from it, don't compromise, and that be it. But that's not what God does. God doesn't just tell us not to give in to compromise, spiritual compromise. He also, throughout his word, gives us a way to fight it. And so as we close today, what I wanna do is give you some tactics for fighting compromise. And here's what the Bible tells us to do. So right now, if you're on the verge of compromising your faith, compromising your integrity, compromising your character, this is what the Bible tells us to do. First of all, God says, own your sin. Own your sin. Admit it, acknowledge it, own it. Proverbs 20, verse 13 says, the one who conceals his sins will not prosper. So stop pretending like your sin isn't there or isn't a big deal. Own it. Own the fact that it's a problem. Don't try to hide it. Don't try to cover it up. Don't make excuses. Own your sin. Own your temptation for what it is. So let me ask you again. Right now, what's your marshmallow? What is it that you're too close to? Right now, what's your black bear? What have you invited into your life, into your home that shouldn't be there, that has the potential of devastating your life? Own your sin. Call it out. The second thing the Bible tells us to do is to confess it to God. In 1 John 1 verse 9, it says, If we confess our sins, the Lord is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Yes, God already knows our sins. He recognizes our sins before we even recognize them. Yes, God already knows what we're doing what sin we're close to, what black bear we've invited into our lives. He knows that. But the Bible tells us to confess it to him because when we do, we get it off our chest and we are reminded, we are assured that our God is a God who can heal us, who can take that sin from us, who can help us out of it. We have a God who forgives us, who loves us, and who has the ability to purify us through the sacrifice of his son. So once you own it, confess it to God. Third, the Bible tells us that we then need to share it with a godly friend. In James 5, verse 16, it says, Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. You need to find a godly friend that will hold you accountable, someone who will walk alongside you, someone who will help you out, someone who will call you out when you need to be called out. Because here's what I have found found out about in my own life, it's a lot easier to fight sin with someone than and alone. And that's a reason why here at First Church, we believe in life groups. Because it's easy in a church our size just to show up to services and hear Bible teaching and go home. And yes, you can apply it on your own, but it's a lot easier to apply that teaching when you have someone else living life with you, doing it with you, a godly friend, a person of faith who's helping you along the way, who's encouraging you, who's praying for you. And that's why we believe in life groups here. Because so many churches, you just show up, you get entertained, you hear the Bible teaching, you go home. Or they may even have classes. You go and you get more head knowledge, but then you turn around and you go home and you're still on your own. We don't want you to be on your own. We want you to do life with people of faith so they can hold you accountable, pick you up when you need to be picked up, encourage you when you need to be encouraged, support you when you need to be supported, and call you out when you need to be called out. That's why the Bible says confess your sins to one another. Share it with a godly friend. And then the last thing we can do to fight compromise is to serve someone. Serve someone as a way to fight temptation, as a way to fight sin. In Galatians 5.13, the Bible says, but do not indulge the sinful nature, rather serve one another in love. And in my own life, when I'm serving other people, I'm a lot less likely to be selfish. And when I'm selfish, I'm a lot more likely to sin. So when I serve people, I take my eyes off myself, I put it on other people, and sin, well, it loses its appeal. And there's a reason for that. Because the more life you give away, the more life you get. 
Guys, your life doesn't have to end up like Lot's and my life doesn't have to end up like Lot's. Your life doesn't have to end up devastated by compromise and neither does mine. Every single morning, every single day when we wake up, we get to decide whether our actions are going to bring about life or going to bring about death. We get to decide whether our actions will reflect God's salvation or will reflect sinful devastation. We simply have to decide what side of the line we want to be on. So let me ask you again, where are you? What's the marshmallow in your life that you're too close to? What's the black bear that you've invited into your home, into your life, into your place of work? What is it for you? Because whatever it is, it doesn't have to win in your life. Jesus is greater than anything that's tempting you right now. Jesus is greater than any sin you may have already committed. There is hope for you. Jesus came to purify you. Jesus came to set you free. Your story doesn't have to end up like Lot's. Your story doesn't have to reflect sinful devastation. Your life can be one that reflects God's salvation. That's my prayer for you today. And so if you're struggling with anything right now, we're here to help you. And after the service is done, if you want to come down front, if you want to go and you want to meet with one of our our leaders, we'd be happy to talk with any of you because we want to let you know we're here for you. And your life doesn't have to end in sinful devastation. Your life can end reflecting God's salvation. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you so much for today, for the time we have to be here. And Father, to open up your word. I know the passages that we looked at today, those passages, they're sensitive. They're sensitive texts that talk about some heavy stuff. But Father, you put those passages in your word for a reason so that they will wake us up so we will be warned and we will not make the same mistakes that others have made. Father, I know you want everyone who's listening to this message today to know their life doesn't have to end in sinful devastation. Their life can end reflecting your salvation. So Father, there's anybody who's listening to this message today that's on the verge of giving in to compromise who's too close to their marshmallow, who's invited the black bear into their life. Father, may, we, may they seek the help that you are offering them. And may we be a church that rallies around them and supports them because there is freedom today in your son. In the name of Jesus, I pray, amen.